In the 370s, Jason and Ferre became a prominent player in Greece. After uniting Thessaly, he looked to be heading for great things. But by 370, it was all over. Join me and a guest expert as we discuss what he did and what he could have done. Hi, and welcome to the Ancient History Hound podcast. In this episode, I had the absolute pleasure to discuss Jason of Phorae in Thessaly with Dr. Michael Furman. Dr. Furman is a Greek historian and assistant teaching professor in the Department of Classics at Florida State University. He earned his PhD in Ancient History from the University of St. Andrews in 2017 with a thesis focusing on the interaction between Thebes and central Greek states in the 4th century BC. In addition to his work on 4th century Greece, he publishes on classics, pedagogy and graduate teacher training. In our discussion, we covered what we know about Jason, his accomplishments, and speculate on what his next moves after 370 might have been. Jason is a great what-if character. He is often skipped and overlooked. I hope you find this as interesting to listen to as it was to record. Before we start, just a quick note that you can find show notes on ancientblogger.com and that the Ancient History Hound podcast has its own Twitter profile, at Hound Ancient. It's in my Ancient Blogger Twitter bio, but feel free to follow and check it out separately. Michael, thanks for joining me. I know you're passionate about Jason and Thessaly in this period, and it's something I've tried to achieve in my podcast, namely covering the less well-covered areas of antiquity. How did you end up in this particular area? Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I took a really kind of circuitous route to classics. I actually started my undergrad as a chemical engineer and then did chemistry for a year and didn't really connect with that in the way that I'd always connected to history. Because growing up, like most people that get into archaeology and ancient history of my generation, I wanted to be Indiana Jones, right? Like oh, everybody yeah. wants to be Indiana Jones. Yeah. Uh, until you actually start learning about archaeology and realize that Indiana Jones is not a particularly good archaeologist and would probably get kicked <laughs> out of most uh, universities today. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I was at Bucknell and I was taking... Uh, this class on Greek history and my professor, uh, Stephanie Larson, who is still there, is a scholar of Boeotia and Central Greece. And so that's kind of how I got into it is that I had a mentor that was interested in it and that I actually learned about it fairly early on, which a lot of people don't get to do. So for me, when it came time to go to grad school and pick a topic for study, I really just thought about you know this area that's super fascinating, that's relatively understudied. Still, Boeotia is understudied, Thessaly even more so. Yeah. And it's just a great uh, opportunity, I think, for myself and for a lot of other scholars to actually do something fruitful with Greek history. It does underline that you don't have to be someone who was necessarily translating Caesar's Gallic War at the age of seven. You can end up studying and you know participating in ancient history at any level at any point in your life. And I think that's a really important message to get out there because it is seen as a very closed subject to people. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And it is something that, you know, in the US at least, classics is often approached in two ways. It's either a found major, like what I did, where I just kind of find classics through my interest in history, or it's a major where, like you said, you've been translating Caesar since you were like seven or something like that and come in knowing that you want to study more Latin. Um, and I think now the balance is going a little bit more toward having that kind of discovery and that exploration of classics in college and that being something that still allows you to engage with the ancient world and to go on into grad school. And I think that's a really positive thing for the discipline. Absolutely. I do wonder though, if I had a Venn diagram and I've got chemical engineering and ancient history, where the overlap is and if any anyone's listening that can come up with any possible ideas of if there's any kind of crossover subjects i'd be fascinated to know if there are any uh, which actually brings me to social media and where people can get in touch with you if they want to understand more about it or they've got any questions or just generally where they can find you yeah so they can email me through my official fsu email which is just m Furman m f u r m a n at fsu.edu or they can a tweet at me on Twitter, which I'm relatively new to, but I'm enjoying the experience so far. Uh, my handle is at Prof Beosha. When your Twitter handle popped up, it did so shortly after I had managed to record my Thebes episodes. 
And it was terrifying because I thought, oh, here we go. Someone who, after three episodes of doing something on Thebes, I've got someone who's got Boeotia uh, actually in their hand- handle. <laughs> and I thought, this is where I'm just going to get slated or something. But you were very pleasant, so I appreciate that. Thanks. <laughs> we're going to be talking about Jason of Foray and Thessaly in the fourth cent- early 4th century BCE. And obviously, everything from now on will be BCE, so I won't be saying BCE anymore. I want to set some context, though. And to start with, could you could you pin the tail on the donkey? Can people find where Thessaly is? And I'll be honest with you, I wasn't totally sure. I knew where it wasn't, but I wasn't completely sure. I'll put all these in the show notes, by the way. I'll put maps in there and obviously put where they can contact you as well. If you were to find Athens, you know roughly where Athens is, and you would to follow the coast north, you go through Boeotia, and then you hit, effectively, Thessaly. And it's probably the best description of it is akin to what Herodotus and Strabo have described it as. That is to say, you've got a large plain, huge plain with a number of rivers in it, mountains encircling it. And then on the east coast, you've got the Aegean Sea. And that's really what Thessaly was. And if you've played Civilization, you'll see it and you would think, Mike, that is a legendary start right there. So, you know, again, reference to all your gamers out there. It was a perfect place. Very unusual because if you consider the topography of ancient Greece or Greece, you will notice that it's generally speaking up and down, up and down, up and down. Whereas in Thessaly, you've got a big plained area. And I won't give too much away now, but that becomes a really important thing, which we'll obviously will cover later. Yeah, the region is really important in a lot of different ways, both mythologically and historically, which we'll go through in in a little bit here. But yeah, it is kind of this unknown area of ancient Greece. And I think the thing to emphasize is also how vast and how diverse the geography actually is. Uh, there is this you know central plain surrounded by mountains. There is access to the ocean and therefore trade routes. So it's a really kind of unique and important area in ancient Greece that, again, like you said, people couldn't find on a map. Culturally, uh, what do we know about how it was viewed by other Greek city states or or generally its neighbors what was what were the perceptions yeah so it doesn't get the same kind of level of distrust or outright hostility that Macedon was you know there's lots of debates over whether the ancient Macedonians are considered to be Greek or not that distinction doesn't really exist with the the Thessalians but that's not to say that there aren't stereotypes around them and there have been some really good pieces lately, one by Emma Aston, who I believe is at Reading, about this stereotype of the corrupting, rich, dangerous Thessalian. Like, Thessaly is where you go if you want to get corrupted by wealth and money in the mind of the Southern Greeks. And so this idea of hospitality and kind of lavishness and having everything be right there at your fingertips and being kind of Eastern and corrupt in that sense is something that is definitely a view of Thessaly in the classical period from these other states, particularly Southern Greece. The Boeotians share some common ethnic background with the Thessalians, mm. so they're a little bit nicer on them. Because <laughs> normally those qualities that you've just described are afforded to the Persians and to the distinctly non-Greeks. Do you think there was a, a, an element there of almost importing and, and getting as close as you could do to having kind of not a Persian Greek, but someone who emboldens those qualities that were seen as as negative in some way? Partially, and I think it might it might also be motivated politically because of the political structure of Thessaly. Right. Their political organizations tend to be a lot looser than what we see in Southern Greece. They arrive at democracy extremely late. So if you're looking at, at it from a democratic perspective, you might be thinking that they are Persian-like in that way where you have small groups of people running these individual cities. Mm-hmm. And I think you might also say that because historically they do align with the Persians during the Persian Wars, yeah. there might be some emphasis on that as well. Well, I know Thebes certainly got a lot of attention um, throughout the fifth century. It always crops up. It's the first thing that is often referred to is that you were the you were with the Persians at Plataea, and um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that was held against them. It was a kind of sins of the father thing. Culturally, it it, it held a lot of the central characters, such as uh, Jason, Jason the Argonauts' fame, Achilles. If you're thinking about centaurs and Lapith, that's what they're from, and even the battle between the Titans and the Olympians. That's that happened in Thessaly. You've got Mount Olympus there. Yeah, absolutely. And the mythological tradition in Thessaly is so fascinating based on how much 
we have of it and how much is placed there, like you were saying, versus the relative lack of study of it in the historical period comparatively. So the mythological tradition has always been extremely rich. It's just that matter of looking at into the classical period, even the late archaic period, and kind of pulling out all of this historical information about Thessaly that really hadn't been worked on in quite a long time. The beginning of the fourth century gets somewhat overlooked, partially because of the Peloponnesian War. Peloponnesian War finishes at the end of the fifth century. People generally or have a, a tendency to sort of overlook it and just turn over and turn back on around the time that Alexander pops up. I, how do you go about explaining or how would you go about giving a brief overview of the beginning of the fourth century? The one word that you can use is just kind of chaos because lots of things are going on. And usually when people are asking about you know, why the fourth century, particularly the first half of the fourth century, isn't particularly well studied in comparison to the start of the Hellenistic period later on. It's usually because things get extremely complex. You've got okay. all these different figures emerging. And I think part of it is also just the way that we've taught Greek history over time, historically. You generally, when you're sitting in like an undergraduate Greek history class, you get a lot of stuff in the archaic period, Solon, Pisistratids, all of yeah. that stuff. Then you get the Persian Wars, which are a major event. You spend a couple weeks on that. Then you get the Peloponnesian War and you spend a couple weeks on that. You get to the death of Socrates right at the turn yeah. of the century. And you talk about that for a while and talk about Greek philosophy. And then if you look at the way it's taught, a lot of syllabi just kind of devolve into yeah, Socrates dies, then some stuff happens, and then there's Alexander. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's really important to have the stuff going on. Mm. But a lot of it is just a realignment, like you've been talking about, a realignment of political entities and political rivalries in the Greek world. You have Athens and Sparta and Thebes now shifting sides between each other. The Corinthian mm. War is one of the most epic conflicts yep. imaginable. You get the Persians in there as well. Uh, fighting against the Spartans. So there's a lot of complexity to it. And one of the reasons that people don't study it is because it's hard. I was trying to work out when I was walking the dog, how would I try and explain to someone who wasn't familiar with, with Greek history? I just saw him an episode of Jerry Springer where you have a table with a load of food on it because that's really all that happens. It's just everyone is just chucking stuff at each other. You, know, you can think about it like if there are any wrestling fans out there, like WWE, like Royal Rumble or King yeah. of the Ring or something yeah. like that, where you've got these people fighting in the ring and then all of a sudden, oh my God, is that Thebes music? And yeah. Yeah. You know, it comes out <laughs> with a chair uh, or or something like that. So, you know, it's that type of chaos that we see mm. playing out. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is, again, fascinating. It's part of the reason why I think it is so, it's such an interesting area once you get stuck into it. And that brings us then to Thessaly, beginning of the fourth century. What are the leading up events what happens for jason to arrive on the scene yeah so this this chaos that we're seeing in the fourth century a lot of individuals try and take advantage of that one individual that we only get uh, might be a singular mention or there might be one more somewhere in some other source is this guy named lycophron who is also associated with ferry and we see him right before the corinthian war breaks out start to try and consolidate all of these different parts of Thessaly into one, because what had been keeping Thessaly from being a major player as a whole on the Greek stage is that you have these cities and you have these aristocrats in this kind of narrow political alignment ruling their individual cities, and it's kind of insular, and they're all rivals with one another in these different cities. So what Lycophron is trying to do is he's trying to conquer cities one by one until they're all united under his rule. And the fear of this happening is pretty apparent because the Boeotians immediately send an army up to try and stop him from doing that. And we know that he's on the brink of doing it, but doesn't do it uh, eventually. So it's kind of a uh, kind of a cliffhanger in terms of what happens, but we know he wasn't successful at it, uh, at least. So that's the kind of environment that Jason is then emerging from. And you've got all these other powers like Thebes and Sparta and Athens kind of duking it out in southern Greece and then also over in Asia Minor. So Jason is kind of able to sneak onto the scene mm. and start to accumulate this power and fulfill the thing that Lycophron was trying to do. When do we first hear of Jason? Yeah, so Jason is already established as the ruler of Pherae by the time we get to the first mention of him in 
literature. And the first act that he has is trying to establish a tyrant, a guy named Neogenes, on uh, the island of Euboea in a city called Histiaea. And Histiaea is on the very most northern point of Euboea, and it helps control access to yeah. the Euboean Gulf. So it's very important uh, in trade. And Jason is able to install him in that role for a time until the Spartans come and kick him out for uh, misrule, or they take advantage at least of the discontent of the people of Histiaea with Neogenes and remove him from power until the Spartans are then removed themselves by a weird accident uh, on the part of the Thebans. But that's really where we see Jason first. He's trying to, if you view this as kind of an intentional program of what he's doing, he seems to be trying to control access to the Euboean and Pagasetic Gulfs, which is where his harbor city, where the harbor city of Ferre, which is called Pagasae, uh, is. And so in order to you know, maintain control over kind of that mercantile area, if he can get allies in these strategic locations, he's then able to increase his own wealth and continue to grow his power. When do we have that? Do we have a rough date of that in terms of... I get th- uh, 379. Okay. Wow. Okay. So it's three, 379 is where he starts. Yeah, it's, it's the early 370s. You, you talk about the fact that this involves sort of trade. It's strategic. Mm-hmm. Does he come across as someone who, who understands or has a particularly mercantile view of the world? It's difficult to say. It seems like he has a clear awareness of the economic potential of Thessaly. We have a speech in Xenophon that Xenophon reports kind of third hand. It's a speech that's given to the Spartan assembly by a ambassador from the the Thessalian city of Pharsalus, who is reporting to them a speech that Jason gave to him. So it's kind of passing through all these different layers. But in the speech, Jason talks about the economic potential of Thessaly, particularly in terms of livestock, agriculture, and timber in building a fleet. And he even talks about how he has plans to crew the fleet with uh, this group of people in Thessaly known as the Penestai that are kind of this surf class. I don't like to put medieval terms on things, but they're they're not enfranchised citizens um, for sure. So he's got all of this kind of worked out in his head, apparently, according uh, to Xenophon. And in terms of money, you, you need money to be a tyrant anyway. We see that even with tyrants yeah. in Southern Greece. Um, But for Jason, it's even more important because he uses a mercenary army to maintain control over progressively larger regions of Thessaly as he goes outward. And mercenaries need a lot of money in order Mm. uh, to operate. And we've got some kind of stories that are in dubious sources. A lot of them are from Polyane. <laughs> they're the best ones. They are, they are, yeah. They're the most interesting for sure. <laughs> uh, the, a lot of them are in Polyanus, which is not a great biographical source, but it does speak to at least how Jason might've been perceived in the later tradition. And pretty much all the stories, I think except for one that's about him taking over a city by subterfuge, all the other stories involve him ripping off his own family. So, oh, right. Okay. Yeah, so he talks about... Um, There's one story where he knows that his brother is rich and he needs to get his brother out of the house so he can go steal all his brother's wealth. And so when he has a child, he has a naming ceremony for the child that invites all of his family. And so they come over to his house and they then Jason pretends to go out hunting. And as he's out hunting, he just goes straight to his brother's house and kind of robs him blind and uses all of his money (laughs) to help fund uh, fund his army. And there are multiple stories like that. His mother pays off some of his mercenaries at some point as well. And th- these are stories that we don't get in like Xenophon. Um, they're in these, again, dubious, but interesting. Sources. It sounds very much like a Jerry Springer thing now. <laughs> more, yeah, more. It's, it's a very much a family, yeah, family conflict here. Yeah. You mentioned the resources in Thessaly mm-hmm. and it's something we, or rather I hinted at to start with. When we talk about resources in Thessaly, we're talking about the fact that you have large plains, yeah, absolutely. The resources in both grain and meat. We know that one of Jason's uh, successors, Alexander of Ferre, is importing or is exporting rather uh, meat to Athens at some point in the 360s. So they have surpluses of all of these things. Um, we also have Jason himself that we know is selling money or selling uh grain rather, out of Pagase to the Thebans when they are trying to f- fight yeah. for their survival against the Spartans in the early 370s. Um, this mm-hmm. is right after he uh, puts Neogenes in charge of uh, his TAA. 
what was the political structure and how did you go about uniting? Because it sounds like it was a pretty Im- Im- or more or less impossible thing to do because you have all of these small, I won't call them fiefdoms, but these little factions, families. How do you go about that? And how did he do that? It's a, the narrowest form of oligarchy, which is uh, called dynasteia, where you have a select group of families that are ruling each of these cities. And they're pretty well established even in the fifth century. But like the Eloyads in Larissa are a major family that we see pop up fairly often. And so Jason then is trying to use that factionalism against them of they're not going to come and help each other. So he can pick them off one at a time. And eventually by the time we get the speech of the ambassador from Pharsalus that I mentioned earlier, at that point, Pharsalus is the only holdout left. So he's managing to consolidate uh, all of this. And then once he does eventually end up taking over Pharsalus, he's not really occupying all of these cities because that requires a ton of manpower. He's just yeah. using their resources and their manpower in order to build up uh, his army. And he makes a big deal in his speech to the ambassador that he has gone out beyond the plains of Thessaly and actually started to demand tribute from the people that live in those mountains that ring uh, Thessaly. And that's a big deal because it's something that hasn't happened, according to him, in a very long time. And that's just adding to his wealth again. And then once he has all of these places under his control, we see the emergence of this title that he uses called the Tagus of Thessaly. And there's a lot of controversy and there's a lot of good scholarship on this title, whether it's something that historically existed or it's something that Jason invented. Uh, It might be kind of a little bit of both, where it's a title that's fairly ancient, but hadn't been used in a long time, and Jason kind of puts his own spin on it. But it basically means that you're the ruler of Thessaly and that everyone pays tribute and resources and manpower to you. He must have had a really charismatic ability. Do we find any qualities other than that that we can kind of understand or distill from what he did? Xenophon provides a little bit of a description of... Jason, and it's a little bit of hyperbole, but it's still very interesting. He talks about him being immensely, like physically strong and kind of strapping and just this kind of Superman. He's very charismatic. And one of the things that Xenophon points out, and this kind of goes to Xenophon's view of leadership, is that he does all of the things that he asks his men to do. So, and he does it in full armor. So, according to Xenophon, he's out there working with his men in full armor right. every okay. day, kind of leading by example. And that's something that Xenophon finds really valuable in, in a leader. If you read Xenophon, you're reading the most zealous supporter of a sports team writing about <laughs> his sports team. The, the other team weren't better. It was just we were awful. That, that's essentially Xenophon's description of Lutra. But do you think he's our most plausible source when we're looking at Jason? I mean, he's a contemporary source, um, unless you want to look at the Attic Orators as well for mentions of of Thessaly and them. But yeah, Xenophon is kind of the source you use when you look at the 4th century, particularly at this point in the 4th century. We go back 379, he started to to really come onto the scene. Mm -hmm. Sequentially, where do we go next? Kind of a probably a five-year gap, uh, I would say, until we get his consolidation of Thessaly, which is when the ambassador arrives at Sparta and the Spartans kind of say, no, we can't go help you with this guy. Because one, this guy sounds really scary. And two, we're currently fighting the Thebans. And <laughs> you know, we're kind of stuck already with the manpower that, uh, that we have. So we see him taking on uh, this role of the Tagea. There's a big controversy that will never get solved about whether he's a member of the Second Athenian League or not, because there's conveniently some erasures on the uh, stele of the charter of the Second Athenian League that people say, oh, based on the spacing of the letters, that could be Jason. It could be, uh, you know, Ferioi right there. Um, but I mean, that that's a lot of ink spilled over something that will never. What do you think? If you had to, if you had to choose, sorry to put you on the spot, but if I mean, you it, had to. It would uh, be politically expedient for him to do it because you can always drop out uh, right. or or get kicked out like the Thebans did. Being a member can mean different things because I remember, I'm pretty sure Thebes was a member of it, but they were, not, yep. not to a, not to a, they were kind of like, uh, they got the kind of VIP, I suppose, VIP package. <laughs> yeah. They weren't expected to sort of muck in too much. It was just important for Athens to have Thebes on the document, as it were. Then you've, yeah. you know, you, it carries its own weight. Yeah, and you've got people on the document that are probably never going to go 
like help Athens in it or have help some of these other smaller like islands or whatever, um, you know, in an emergency, you've got like the, uh, Molossians and Epirotes on there, uh, I think that, you know, well, how, that they're not going to they're not going to go help. How do you picture him then? If you if you see we've got these other sources describing or giving some impression of him when when you're thinking of him, what do you see? I mean, I think it's someone that's calculating. I think more of like a personality than a physical person. Although based mm. on Xenophon, it would be like some type of like Chris Hemsworth, Henry Cavill person that would. Yeah. Uh, that would be there. Yeah. And it's someone that seems to be very politically astute at least. And we can kind of tell that from what he's doing previously with his approach to the other cities of Thessaly of, Hey, I've got this mercenary army sitting on your doorstep. I could destroy you, but it's more fun to play along. And, you know, you can be my, you can be my second city or second in, in command and we'll all benefit together. That takes a certain degree of political skill. When Philip II, the Philip of Macedon, is is referenced the idea is that because he was at Thebes that gave him a grounding in what the politics of to him southern Greece was all about and he understood Uh how the different states just didn't did and didn't get on how to play the game Uh but with Jason he wasn't given that opportunity so either it wasn't something that Philip inherently learned it through through being at Thebes it was something that he was just aware of as a skill set and with Uh Jason then because we don't know about him previously, he had an ability to read a political situation without mm-hmm. that experience of being based in southern or to the south, to the southern city states and experience in that way. So I think it kind of speaks volumes that he was able to get the right read on the political scenario and the political landscape without having been directly involved in it. Yeah, and his timing could not have been more perfect, really, because if you're looking at the early 370s as his like emergence onto the wider scene he's timing it really well with what's happening in Thebes um, because yeah. you know, Thebes just uh, gets liberated by Polypodos and his companions hmm. in 379, early 378 maybe. And he, um, Thebes is still fighting like for its survival at this yeah. point. Yeah. That what happened to Lycophron where Thebes sends an army to stop him. That's not going to happen to Jason, at least no. for a while. So Jason is stepping into this vacuum that Thebes has left because the Boeotian League has been dismantled and the Boeotian League is what made Thebes relevant yeah, and powerful yeah. in central Greece. He's stepping into that as a way for him to expand his own power. How did he go on with other city-states? You talk about Thebes um, mm-hmm. to the south. Did he have any significant interactions with any other regions in Greece or city-states? He talks about being on friendly terms with the Spartans as well and with the Athenians. Um, when he arrives at Leuctra, he talks about being able to negotiate because he's a friend of both Thebans and the Spartans. That's not something that's super unusual. You would have different bonds of friendship between people of different city-states. Um, but it seems like he's played nice with pretty much everybody uh, outside of, of Thessaly as he continues to accumulate power because there's no need for him to send an army when he can kind of threaten people with the giant army back home and they'll gladly ally with him. Yeah, you mentioned Lucha there and it's probably worth bringing his involvement or his influence into that. Thebes has beaten the Spartan army. Jason is there and he's he's really almost creating Theban policy. So if you can just briefly explain that. Yeah, so everyone forgets about Jason's involvement at Lutra. Everyone thinks about Lutra and says, "Oh, it's Thebes defeating Sparta." But, you know, battles like that aren't always aren't usually super decisive. Like you don't wipe out the other army in its entirety, no. so you're still regrouping. So while they're regrouping from the initial battle in which the Spartan king Cleombrotus was killed, which was a big deal, you see Thebes sending to its allies, its nominal allies, uh, Athens and Jason to come and help them finish the Spartans off. And Athens kind of looks at, looks at this and recoils and says, well, if we do this, then we're just handing Thebes the keys to Greece, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And they take a hard pass on going to help the Thebans. But Jason shows up. Uh, he marches his army down with his mercenaries, uh, shows up at Lutra, and actually arbitrates the arrangement of the Spartans leaving Boeotia between the Thebans and the Spartans. So... In this one battle, you know, you say the Thebans won. Jason also won in a way here because he's getting Mm. massive amounts of recognition from two of the leading states of Greece that he is a suitable arbiter for 
this case and to be kind of a leading statesman. And it's genius to him in a way because he doesn't want to destroy Sparta either because he needs to keep Thebes busy. Right? You don't yeah. want to yeah. give Thebes back all of their power that they had at the start of the Corinthian War because then they pose a direct challenge to him. So by preserving the remaining Spartan army, Jason is essentially guaranteeing that the Spartans will continue to pose at least some kind of challenge to Thebes in the years to come. And he can continue building up uh, for whatever he's going to do next. It's 371. Without giving too much away, we don't have much more time with with him. Um, <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you think was on his to-do list next? Yeah, I think the next thing on the to-do list, based on his actions immediately after Lutra, is pushing his power out of Thessaly more into central Greece. So he would push it southward. And you see him doing this because he fights the Phokians on the way back from Lutra. He fights the Phokians, and then he also destroys the fortress at a place called Heraclea Trachinia, which is fairly close to Thermopylae. Uh, It doesn't have the same strategic value as Thermopylae, but one thing that we know existed at Heraclea Trachinia are docks, uh, fortified docks, actually. And so if he was able to control those, then he might be able to push more into Euboea, maybe go retake Histiaea or something like that. Uh, And then with the Phokians, he's able to push almost all the way to Delphi uh, if he were to take the, the Phokians on. And yet, you well, I suppose you can kind of give us the big spoiler. What happens next? And and then he gets assassinated. So as he <laughs> uh, as he is preparing to go to the Pythian festival, which is in Delphi, where he will pres- he's meant to preside over the Pythian festival. He's gathering all these resources to show the massive wealth uh, of Thessaly. It's just this conspicuous display of power that he's planning on putting on. He's ordering ten thousand livestock to come with him on this procession from Thessaly to Delphi to be sacrificed uh, at this festival. 10,000 is a lot of livestock. Um, And it goes goes back to reinforce our point on uh, the material wealth of Thessaly in terms of agriculture. But as he's getting ready to do this, he's kind of fielding requests from people. He's sitting in his chair, fielding requests from the Salians that need their cases arbitrated or something like that. seven young youths come up and kill him. A couple of them get killed by his bodyguards, but the rest escape. And according to Xenophon, there's a lot of joy in all the cities that welcome these assassins in. They get celebrated because everyone at this point was so afraid of Jason um, and what he would do. So yes, he's a massive now kind of like what if of history is that he seems to have been gearing up for something fairly major to really emerge once again onto the Greek stage and follow up from Lutra in doing that. And then he gets assassinated and everything kind of falls apart. Do we know anything about the assassins? Nope. Just uh, as, as the only thing that I know about them from what I've read is that they are uh, seven youths that were unhappy with Jason. People look and they're so obsessed in the fourth century to go to Philip, to go to Alexander. Mm-hmm. How do we see Jason set against those characters? Yeah, you know, putting aside the invasion of Asia that is kind of a centerpiece of Philip and Alexander that Jason probably didn't have ambitions toward uh, at all. If we're looking at just his policy toward the rest of Greece, I think you can see him pretty easily taking over the Amphictyony and kind of staking his claim as a quasi-leader of at least central Greece. Maybe he's thinking about uh, annexing, not annexing really, but um, bringing the Boeotians into more of an alignment with him, depending on what the Thebans end up doing, whether the Theban invasions of the Peloponnese go well or not. Um, and I think that's the type of thing that also gives Philip access later on, right? Of mm. this idea that the sacred war has exhausted all these different players in Southern Greece. And now they're calling for him to help them in kind of their own little spats with each other he's ecstatic when when thieves say can you come and help us he's like oh go on then Um, oh absolutely not not gonna leave isocrates mentions him and he talks about him as a sort of panhellenic yeah i'm i'm not i'm a little bit skeptical of any claims that jason is thinking about uniting greece under this like title of the hellenes and then going to liberate the greeks of asia which is always something that we hear from uh, attic orators in particular But 
I, I really do think that he's interested in just kind of continually expanding his own power. I don't know if he thinks that that far ahead. He seems mm. very opportunistic in everything that he does. And I think that's a good way to uh, describe him. But yeah, if we're talking about this idea of Panhellenism, of going to fight the Persians, there's really no indication that Jason would have ever been interested in that. Why do you think, what do you think their motivations were for that? Oh, it's a way to, it's a way to rile up different Greek states. I mean, the whole, <laughs> the whole idea of Panhellenism is kind of this invention that everybody hates the Persians until they need their money. Yeah. Right? yeah. Well, I mean, you see that throughout uh, oh, yeah. the, the fifth and fourth centuries, this idea of like uh, great culture war kind of evaporates when the Persians are offering you a fleet and money to help Absolutely, you in your yeah. war. The Persians, yeah, they, they sent over huge, huge armies, which didn't fare too well, but they just needed to flash the credit card a bit. And they, <laughs> they, they did far more damage or they had far more success, I should say, with that than they ever did. And every single Greek city state seems to come from the same point of that's disgusting. That's so immoral. Moral. When's my turn? Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're all at it, which is, uh-huh. you know, again, it shows you politics perhaps hasn't changed a great deal. <laughs> what are your thoughts then in, in terms of how Jason is explained and understood? Where do you think he fits in the fourth century? And where do you think he fits with the sort of wider Greek, Greek history and how it's taught? Yeah, I mean, I think he is a really vital part of a lot of history in the fourth century. And it's not just him, it's all these other figures. I mean, Thebes is not something that people learn a ton about when they take like an intro uh, True. Greek Greek history course. And I think that's one of the things that you know, I'm glad that you were inv- inviting me to be on here to talk about these types of things, because the more diversity that we can get and the more new approaches that we can get to learning about the ancient world, especially at the introductory level of, you know, if people find out about Thebes and Jason from the start, all of a sudden you have a lot more people that are interested in studying them yeah. at the graduate level and beyond. Um, and I think that is something that's like really vital. And in terms of how he fits into wider Greek history, we said this in kind of the warm up, but, you know, you were talking about how Alexander is maybe not so great in light of all these other things that people are doing and kind of building up and building this framework that Alexander can then use. And you can think about it like, you know, if uh, Jason and Philip are you know, Queen and David Bowie, then Alexander is uh, Vanilla Ice. You know, he's just using <laughs> he's just using these, uh, just using kind of these things that have been tested out before uh, by other people to fulfill his kind of mission with reckless abandon. It'd be interesting to know. Uh, now you've got that song in my head now, so thanks for that. <laughs> be interesting to know if there was any i couldn't find anything if alexander ever referred back to jason at all i can't imagine he would have done but no what yeah, he, he was too busy comparing himself to gods and achilles yeah, and other yeah people. and yeah. is there anything else you want to say about jason i realize we've spoken a great deal about it and i really want to th- thank you for explaining it so well but is there anything you think we've missed or any areas you want to go over again or, or discuss I don't think so. I think we covered quite a lot here and I think hopefully people will find this valuable and maybe yeah. learn something about somebody that, you know, they never knew about, you know, when you say like, Oh yeah, you know, I'm going to, I was actually telling people, you know, I'm going to go talk on this podcast about Jason and they said, and the Argonauts. And I was like, no, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's not, uh, not, not quite the same. Or, you know, the reason that you have to talk about Jason's predecessor, Alexander as Alexander of Ferre is because we have Alexander yeah. the Great. So, you know, there, there are all these figures and Jason is just one of many that you can look at and think, wow, that's really interesting. But the warning that, that I want to put out there as well, though, is that, you know, history is driven by a lot of forces and not all of those forces are individual. Some of them are collective as well. And in fact, a lot of them are collective. So when we talk about these big figures like Jason of Ferre, right, you know, it's easy to then kind of just slip into this narrative of great man history where he did everything because of his unique genius, where, as we've been talking about today, a lot of this is actually set up by Mm. the previous people. It's set up by conditions. Mm. Uh, It's not all something that Jason has the agency to control. True. Uh, And and certainly his assassination, he didn't have the agency to control. Yeah. And I suppose I'll finish up with just saying goodbye to everyone. And thanks again, uh, Michael, for coming on and, and talking as you have done doing us the honor of of your learning and, you know, your insights into Jason. Thank you. It was great to be here.